Welcome back to Think Tech. Welcome back to Think Tech Talks. Welcome back to um, Enter the Variance. We're going to talk about the variance with our chief scientist, Mike DeWert. Uh, welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you, Jay. Good to be here. Well, virtually there, too. Yeah, well, science, right? So right. it's really extraordinary how far the technology is going. I, I just saw something called, um, I guess it's a, it's a business system made by the Poly Company, P-O-L-Y Company, that makes these conference phones, you know. And they, and they have taken all of this, um, you know, Zoom-type communication to a new and more expensive level. There's money to be made, and they're <laughs> trying to make it. Anyway, Mike, uh, you know, you've done a lot of work examining the variants and, uh, you know, as, as if life wasn't complicated enough these days, um, or as, you know, they say in the Chinese culture, interesting enough these days, um, we have the variants, enter the variants, and every time you look, there's another one, and they're mm -hmm. all over this country already, and they're different. That's the part you have to wrap my mind around. They're all different different implications, different characteristics. You've been mm -hmm. studying them. So uh, how far have you gotten in your studies? What are your thoughts about that? Should we care a lot about them or what? Uh, we should care a, a little bit about them, but more and as time goes on. Um, the variants, um, some of them have actual major changes in the spike protein that the, uh, in, that the vaccines target. Um, so far, none of them seems to have enough changes to actually make all the vaccines useless. Um, but there is some concern that some of the vaccines that actually have been tested in South Africa are showing maybe 50% efficacy instead of 90% efficacy. And um, the, that's the problem with evolution is um, once you let these viruses out and you don't control them, they will start mutating and once in a while they'll get lucky and you come up with something that's more contagious or something that's more resistant to vaccine and the worst case is something that's both. Um, and it just adds to the urgency. We've got to get the vaccination program up and running so we can reduce the caseload and thus reduce the chances of more mutations. Yeah, I noticed that um, you know, all the variants we know about came from outside the United States. Which, and, it, and it just goes to prove the point that if you have a global pandemic and you have all these cases going on out there, and in many countries, there really isn't a, a, a an effective uh, vaccine program right now. The more cases you have, it's mathematical, isn't it? The more yeah. cases you have, the more mutations you have, and the more mutations you have, the more the likelihood, um, it, it's, it's crapshoot, the more likelihood is that there'll be a couple of zingers in there and they will travel faster, they'll be more contagious, more deadly, more resistant to the existing uh, vaccines. Right. Right, or they may end up like AIDS and become less deadly, but that, that way have the victims hang around longer to spread the disease more. Um, we, we just don't know yet, but we really don't want to have to get to the point where we do know and where we have to worry about it. We want to get ahead of it, get everybody vaccinated, and get this thing under control. Just a point of curiosity. So what we what we have seen in the past month or two is the development the emergence of uh, vaccines in various places in the world. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, variants in various places in the world, which are more dangerous, more deadly, more contagious, more uh, arguably resistant to our existing vaccine technology. But couldn't it be that they could likewise, the, the variants could likewise be less dangerous, less contagious, sure. uh, and that they could effectively, you know, take over the earth with a less threatening um, a, a COVID. Is it possible, logically? Well, less contagious variants is unlikely to take over because it will eventually be outcompeted by the more contagious ones. But a, less, a more contagious variant that's less deadly, that's a possibility. It could crowd out the uh, less contagious but more deadly one. Um, it, you, we can't really bank on that. We don't really want to hope for that. Well, we, I mean, you can hope that it becomes less deadly the way AIDS has, um, or you can, but you also just need to make sure you try to kill it off because it could be just more contagious and just as deadly. That's um, probably the, as likely a scenario as more contagious and less deadly. Well, if and, you had, it, it strikes me that if you, if that happened, 
if there was a mutation that was more contagious, but less deadly, in fact, not deadly at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and you let it out in, you know, into the population, uh, then the world would have this um, you know, less, less deadly, more contagious um, strain of the virus. But well, that's pretty risky in itself because it could then mutate into something who knows what. Then it becomes more dangerous, and it's everywhere. And you know we haven't done the right thing. Yeah, that's the thing we do with the uh, Sabin-style polio vaccine. The polio vaccine you get in a sugar cube on drops that you can swallow. It's a live virus that's been attenuated, where it doesn't cause polio symptoms, but confers immunity to polio viruses. Um, you can envision doing something like that and making it very contagious problem with that polio vaccine is sometimes um, a the, the, the vaccine virus will revert back to a dangerous form. That's why we took, uh, there's three strains of polio out in the wild. One had a tendency to revert. And so as soon as we wiped out that strain of polio, we took that strain out of the vaccine to keep it from going wild again. The other two have less tendency to revert, but they're still out there in Afghanistan, Pakistan. We, got to get everybody cured of this disease and we're close to it uh, then we can get rid of all the polio vaccine and not worry about it so yes you can see something like that happening with a covid virus you could see maybe something that it has to be a virus that is less deadly but also confers immunity to the deadly versions um, yeah. to be and i'm not sure we know how to engineer a virus like that but we do know how to do it now with the mRNA technology is engineer a vaccine very quickly for any new variants. So it could be yeah. like- Yeah, the problem, problem is that, um, you know, uh, query, have we done that? Are we doing that? I doubt the Trump administration was, uh, you know, encouraging or supporting that or funding it. Uh, maybe in Europe, uh, I remember a quote in the newspaper by the Turkish guy that uh, it headed up the BioNTech company that partnered with Pfizer for the existing Pfizer uh, vaccine. He said, oh, gee whiz, we can handle variants. It'll take 60, 90 days. We'll just adjust the vaccine to deal with that. Uh, I haven't heard more about it since though. Yeah, I'm sure Pfizer and Moderna are both looking at this. They will want to test, the, have, the problem is you'll have to test the new vaccine and make sure it's as effective as what you have now. Um, but then you can envision a case where they say, well, hey, maybe we don't want to vaccinate everybody and let the variants get out, because then every year we have to make a vaccine. Um, if one were cynical. <laughs> well, I mean, you could get cynical about this. You know, no sooner you get your shot, no sooner does there seem to be a solution and struggling through a distribution system, you know, when enter the variant. Now what? Yeah. And we don't have enough data to know what it means. True. Yeah, all we can do is uh, look at scenarios and try to prepare for various possibilities. Um, I've done some you know, toy pandemic simulations to kind of illustrate the principles. Um, we can show those if you want. Yes, please. Um, yeah, okay, so this, all this is a snapshot of where we are. The United States has got 27 million cases so far. And, you know, going on half a million dead, more people than we lost in World War II. Um, the world's on 100 million cases. And Hawaii, uh, Hawaii is about one one thousandth of the total U.S. caseload. So we're at like 25,000 cases. Um, we're not exponential in Hawaii. We seem to have stabilized at a kind of steady linear growth. Um, the United States is slowing down, fortunately, before getting the message. Um, so that's just where we are. So the next slide I show... Uh, a simulation. I'm uh, so in this simulation, I've changed up the colors a bit from what we had before. Blue are the people who are susceptible, green are the people who are immune, red is the people who are contagious, and black are the dead ones. And in this case, I've taken a virus that um, infects like 30% of its neighbors. If you've got the virus, 30% of the people uh, in contact with you will, on average, get it from you. And then every 10 you know, weeks or so, another uh, tourist comes in or somebody goes to the man and comes back, brings the virus in. So you can see that it kept going around and around and around. So that top line is the infected people versus time. You see how it goes up and down, up and down. And that's because immunity is waning. I put in a, a time for the immunity to wane of about six months. So you get the virus, 
you're immune for at most six, for around six months or so. And then, you know, tourists bring the virus back in and people get sick again. And this goes in waves, you know, every couple of years in this simulation. And the death rate goes, keeps going up and up and up and up. In this case, um, after, in this simulation, 800 weeks, 15, something like 15% of the population is dead. So that's, uh, that's kind of the worst uh, bad case. But what if the virus is more contagious and just as deadly? So that's the next simulation I'll show um, if you go to the next. So this one is spreading faster because it infects about 40% of the people that you, you come in contact with instead of 30%. And you add in the, uh, the tourists bringing the disease in, and it just goes fast, zipping around the whole population very quickly. You can see the black dots growing in the simulation. Um, the end result of that is that uh, the population never really gets a rest from the disease. It's, it spreads so quickly that you don't, your, your waves don't go down very low before the next wave comes along. And they get a higher death rate uh, just because the immunity, because it's so contagious that uh, there's less herd immunity possible. Um, and this one only starts to slow down where about 15% of the population has died of the virus, so they're not infectable anymore. So now let's hypothesize, what if we had a vaccine for that more contagious virus? And what if that vaccine were 94% effective? And that's uh, the next simulation. So in this simulation, the green spots where people are vaccinated or naturally immune, you see the red just never gets a chance to really get going. Every once in a while, there'll be a cluster of red cells show up, but they never really spread because there's so much. Now, now this is flickering because the immunity is waning, but we keep vaccinating. We vaccinate about 5% of the population every week. And that's enough to keep the virus at bay. So if we go to the next slide, you see what's happened. That top red curve is we had an initial spike when we just started vaccinating of cases, but it was far fewer than the cases we had. Uh, we had like 3% of people sick at any one time. This is like 0.3%. And then it never really picks up again. The death rate's way lower. Uh, less than a percent, even after um, 800 weeks of the simulation. So with a 94% effective vaccine and vaccinating um, every 50,000, 5% of the population every every week, this we get rid of it. It's gone. Well, what if we only had a vaccine that was 50% effective, but we're still vaccinating 5% of the population next week? That's the next simulation. So on this one. It does get an initial spread, but you know, even at 50% effectiveness, this, um, this vaccine, because we keep vaccinating 5% every week, which in Hawaii would be like 50,000 a week. But again, the virus is never going to get a toehold. Even at just a 50% effectiveness, we've tamped it down. And so if you look at the next slide, we'll show the results of this. Um, clearly, there's an initial spike, but it's still smaller than the spikes with the unvaccinated populations. You do get some subsequent waves as exogenous sources bring the virus back in, but they're nowhere near as big as before, and death rate's still low. So even a 50% effective vaccine, if you vaccinate everybody, if you keep vaccinating people to stay ahead of the waning immunity, is effective. But what if you decide, or for some reason there's a shortage, and you can't vaccinate 5%, you know, you can't vaccinate faster than the immunity wanes, what if you can only vaccinate two percent of the people a week? You know, 50 weeks to vaccinate everyone with an immunity that wanes after half a year. So you get one year to vaccinate everyone, and the immunity wanes after half a year, and you've got only 50 percent effectiveness of the vaccine. What happens then? Now that that's in the next simulation, and this one you see it looks almost as bad as the very first one I showed. Um, there's waves of contagion keep coming around. Um, the black dots keep increasing, and um, it's because we're not vaccinating in this simulation fast enough to keep up with waning immunity. <clears throat> so you can see the results in the next slide. I summarize. So the red peaks, so the peaks are almost as high as in the unvaccinated population. There's still nice big gaps between waves of contagion, and they do eventually attenuate. But you you still have quite a quite a bad crisis, and you still end up with 
um, you know, over 80, 800 weeks of this simulation, 10% or so of the population having died of this disease. Uh, and this is a toy simulation. It's something that could be coded up by a bright high school kid with access to MATLAB. Um, more sophisticated simulations will undoubtedly show slightly different results, but this will show the general principles. You've got to vaccinate fast enough to keep ahead of waning immunity. You've got to vaccinate. Having a vaccine isn't enough. You must vaccinate the people. And that's the only way to protect your entire population from this thing. You know, there's a national conversation going on, if not debate going on, as to whether you take the second shots that were being held in abeyance, and instead of giving them to the people who received the first shots, you give them to new, um, new members of the population. Thus, um, by definition, you know, reducing the efficacy of the, of the series of shots uh, for everyone. But, but uh, where do your numbers show on that? What, you know, what, what, is it, what do your analyses show on that question? Should we be doing that or should we make sure to give everybody the full two doses? Uh, well, I didn't address that in the simulation, but my look at the simulation is that you're better off vaccinating as many people as you can, as fast as you can, and then trying to fill up the uh, you know, pipeline with vaccine and get the second vaccine as well as you can um, before the first vaccine immunity has waned, which looks like we're looking at months for that to happen, not, not days or weeks. So you have time. You should get everybody, as many people vaccinated as possible. And what the simulation is showing, uh, in this simulation, we didn't just vaccinate. I mean, the simulation didn't make a distinction between high risk people who would die of the disease more readily or people who are low risk. It just said randomly vaccinate the population. And that was enough to slow it down and, and stop the contagion from spreading. And there's some thought that we should even be vaccinating the spreaders, you know, people, uh, well, certainly healthcare providers will see a lot of sick people, but also people who face the public a lot and have a lot of contact with a lot of people. If we vaccinated the spreaders first, maybe we'd be more effective at slowing it down. That's a bit controversial because now you're not vaccinating the people in the nursing home first. Um, so what I really hope is that we can get the production and distribution up to the point where we don't have to make that kind of a choice. But yeah, we should, we need to get as many people vaccinated as soon as we can and then get the cycle going of revaccinating um, as soon as we can get that going again. So oh, efficacy is not is not critical. It's the primary thing is to is get as many people vaccinated as possible. Some some of these uh, vaccines are more efficacious than others, but it, in the end, it doesn't matter. Just just get them all out there, and uh, get get people vaccinated. I guess that's what I hear you saying. Yeah, what the simulations are showing is that the vaccine is even only fifty percent effective if you vaccinate enough people, you can shut down the epidemic. Um, and that's sort of the good news. The bad news is you got to vaccinate enough people, which is the bigger logistic problem. You know, right now we aren't able to get vaccine out as fast as it was promised. And we really, really need to get it out there. If we can vaccinate fast enough, we can stay ahead of the contagion, even with a less effective vaccine. And buy time for a more effective vaccine um, as new strains of the disease develop. Yeah, well, we also have a time factor in how long the vaccines last. In other words, if you say, let's, let's do everybody and let's hustle to do that. And then you, and it takes you, let's say, you know, using your assumption in, in the charts, it takes you six months to do that. Well, now you got to start it up all over again. <laughs> and then vaccine and give them vaccinations again in, in six months, no? Right, well, that's, that, that, so what I showed was assuming that you were constantly revaccinating people about 5% every week of the population um, with even a 50% effective vaccine. And this simulation, which isn't necessarily truly like COVID, but it illustrates the principle. Um, you're, you're not waiting six months, you're not vaccinating everybody this week and then waiting six months to vaccinate everybody again. You're vaccinating people every week and then they come back you know, six months later, but it's staggered now. So you can keep up with the demand. Uh, so you have an ongoing constant vaccination program. And that's what was in this simulation, which with modern, with the uh, 
uh, the uh, Pfizer and the Moderna technology you can do. You don't have to incubate it in chicken eggs. You can grow it in a, in a vat, you know, essentially using this uh, mRNA technology and have those vaccines ready. And I, I agree with the Turkish, uh, I can't remember his name, but the leader of Bio, BioNTech that uh, the, uh, they can do it in 90 days. You know, they can put out new vaccines, maybe combining the old mRNA with mRNA for the new strains pretty quickly. But we just need to make sure that pipeline's filled and get the machine going to keep that pipeline filled. Um, now, of course, this makes a huge revenue stream for the vaccine makers, you know, an ongoing reliable source of income. Um, but if the immunity is actually permanent, then you need less, you're, there's less urgency. If the immunity, once you're vaccinated, stays for more than six months, stays a couple of years, then you can, you have less of a logistics problem because you can take more time between vaccinations. Yeah, the one thing I can't uh, wrap my head around is uh, the, the notion that all the variants uh, vary from the other variants. Uh, they, they, they spring up, um, you know, in the yeah. different geographical locations, different mutations, they're not yeah. the same. So that if um, the guy, the Turkish guy in Germany in BioNTech, Bio, 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 um, you know, he finds something on variant one, good. Now we all, you know, run to that side of the boat we make a new vaccine for variant one, it, it's probably going to be different than the existing vaccines we have today. And then, of course, we have to go variant two and three and how many others. And my question to you is, uh, so how do I know which vaccine to take? Yeah. Um, well, you know, that spike protein can't change that much without reducing its own effectiveness at infecting cells. So that's probably why, so far, the vaccines even the older vaccines seem to be effective against the uh, new variants, or at least at 50%. Like uh, the Moderna and the Pfizer seem to be retaining effectiveness better than AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, it needs to be seen and you need to do some more trials. Um, so it's not clear that you need a new vaccine for every variant. Um, now there's other ways these viruses can mutate. You know, They have to fuse their outer jackets with your cell in order to release their payload into the cell they take advantage of cholesterol to do that. So some of those mutations may be in that part of the process, making it easier for them to infect your cells without affecting the spike protein. Um, as I said, if the spike protein changes too much, then it's no longer effective at infection. So um, there, there's gonna be, all, I, I, think, I think we're still in early days determining how quickly we have to come with new vaccines. I don't think we're at the point yet where we have to panic that we need a new vaccine. I think we need to get the vaccines we have out there as soon as possible and in as many yeah. arms as possible. And what would be yeah. really great is they could come up with an oral vaccine um, instead of having to take a shot because then you could distribute it really quickly. Yeah, even at home, you could just take, have it mailed to your house and take it, so. Without the necessity of, um, of uh, refrigeration or anything like that, ideally. Yes. Yeah, the shelf stable. Well, yeah. So what this suggests to me, I mean, I, you make a comparison, you have to make a comparison between this and, and the flu, because the flu changes every year and it changes by virtue of, of exactly the same mutation process. And, um, you know, like a big question I, I would ask you is, if I take, um, um, if I have last year's flu, if I have been infected with last year's flu, and I take this year's flu vaccine, Will that help me? Uh, yeah, I mean, most likely will. I mean, the problem is that they have it to predict in advance which flu vac which flu virus is going to be dominant, and they have to cook it up in chicken eggs, and they haven't applied the mRNA technology yet to the flu, as far as I can tell, which could make it faster and more effective to actually get the strains mm -hmm. out because they can predict like a year in advance what's going to be next year's strain and start the process with that current technology. Um, We'll do better with the mRNA technology than that. We'll, we won't have to wait a whole year to cook up the new vaccine. Um, on the other hand, we do take a flu vaccine every year. And if you've had last year's vaccine, you'll have some immunity against similar flu viruses that may still be circulating. And you might have some cross immunity to this year's. And it can't hurt you to take this year's as well, to this year's vaccine as well. Um, so. Well, if, if, I, if I could develop 
um, a vaccine that would wrap all of the previous vaccines into it. In other words, so we, you know, at the end of th this year, say, I mean, this calendar year, there will be probably more variants, more mutations, uh, because so many people are infected right now. Um, sure. So now I have, say, five, uh, plus the original, and so six altogether. Um, seems to me, if, if science could do this, uh, the mm -hmm. best thing to do would be to, to give me a shot um, with all of the vaccines in it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with six different vaccines in that, in that, in that shot. Sure. Uh, then yeah, cover all the bases. Uh, did the clinical trial to prove that it's safe to give all those variants at once? Um, but that clinical trial doesn't have to be that the new vaccine versus nothing. It could be the new vaccine versus the first vaccine, which would be the most ethical way to do the trial. Um, so they will have to do clinical trials before they do that, but they can do that. I mean, we've got it done in a year. We can do that in a year to show that a multivalent vaccine is really uh, effective and safe and then roll that out. Then we don't have to worry about safety so much in the future because we know it's safe and just keep giving those vaccines. Well, we need, we need science, you know, to inform us as to what the best thing is. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't, we, we don't want to tell, you know, go on old wives tales. We don't want to go on rumor. We don't go on, you know, conspiracy theories or blame game. And uh, I mean, I'm happy to see that Biden is, is respecting science. But in terms of the individual human, well, two questions. One is, is Biden doing the best thing he can do right now to deal with COVID? Or is there something else you would urge him to do? Well, it certainly is doing the right thing to get people to wear the masks in public transport. I mean, and the airlines are happy that that's happening. Um, they put a lot of stewards and stewardesses' minds at ease and pilots' at minds at ease. So. So that's right. And trying to accelerate getting the vaccine, that's right. If he has to invoke the Defense Production Act to get the vaccination supplies made, that's the right thing to do too. Um, helping industry ramp up production uh, would be the next thing that would really need to be done. Uh, if there's a bottleneck in production, then anything the government can do to help you know, fund that, fund getting rid of those bottlenecks, we should do. So. And the pharmacy, the, the pharmacy distribution system, that, that sounds like a good idea. It seems to me that would be better than an ad hoc arrangement, um, you know, handled by the hospitals. Yeah, no, I mean, next week we'll start shipping it to the pharmacies. I look forward to going to CVS whenever my turn in line comes up. You know, I'm probably way, way down the list because I don't have any really underlying risk factors. And um, yeah, doing it through the pharmacies is a very good idea. Do it through as many kind of pharmacies as you can. All the ones are the right refrigeration facilities. Um, and helping them develop those refrigeration facilities, especially in the rural areas and where they're underserved populations. Yeah, you do have to have a system within the pharmacy. It's not like you can just do it with the existing structure, existing infrastructure. You, you have to build people systems to get them through the process. Oh, um, yeah. My last question uh, is, is um, you know, what about the individual? I mean, it seems to me that the anti-vaxxer movement has diminished. It seems to me that um, people, you know, would like to have the vaccines now. There's been so much good information out there about it, and his transparency has been helping. Um, but I'll tell you the truth, I worry about complacency. You know, sure. People make the conclusion that, oh, I'll get a shot. I'll be fine. We'll all be fine. <laughs> and then they stop wearing masks. So what's your advice to the individual? Wear your mask until enough people are vaccinated that the contagion's not around anymore. Um, that's, it's hard to do, um, but it's one way we can get back to commerce. You know, I, I'll be more comfortable, you know, after I've been vaccinated going to a restaurant and even have to wear a mask until I start eating dinner, um, that would be fine. Right now, I'm not even comfortable going to a restaurant, you know, no matter how many precautions they're taking. Um, and I say, get, get vaccinated as soon as you can, get your loved ones vaccinated, and then we can get back to work, get back to business, get back to having fun, going to the movies maybe. Should I wear my mask then? Sure, yeah. except when you, oh, it's hard to put it. <laughs> Thank you for that. But you know, <laughs> there's been all kinds of, uh, you know, commercials and, 
suggestions, including from the scientists, about how you should you shouldn't go with these flimsy masks. You know, there have been a lot of entries into the marketplace of masks that are really not effective. Then there's been talk about wearing double masks. I've been talking about masks that has that has fabric that interwoven with other uh, components that make them say. But what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, yeah, wear a double layer mask. Um, this is just a plain double layer mask. Two different kinds of cloths. It like static charge between them traps the particles. But you can also get masks like this one has a place where you can put in a filter, like a coffee filter, like kind of material, maybe better. But you can also get an N95 mask, which um, they're, they're available now. I just ordered a bunch from Amazon, you know, 50 for $50. Um, it's a, you can go with the N95s, or then you could, if you don't like the look and you want something decorative, then you could put a, a decorative mask on over your N95 and be extra safe. Um, you can still be a fashion statement. Still be a fashion statement. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, Mike. Be impressive with your eyes. So. <laughs> you have to learn to do that. Mike DeWert, our chief scientist on the variants and uh, enter the variants today. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. Thanks for making those charts and, and uh, uh, scenarios. Really appreciate it. Hope we'll talk you. to you again soon about the same things or other things that develop in our adventure with COVID. <laughs> Aloha, Jay. Aloha.